so um uh, I want to talk about uh, this uh, a little bit, sort of moving towards some recent work uh, on lifting Grotendieck universes to Grotendieck toposes, which I thought was a very difficult title. But then after I heard uh, Colin's talk on uh, earlier this week, I, I was unable to resist giving it a second title, uh, why Grotendieck should have believed in universes. So uh, I think that there's been a sort of an idea popping up in a few places already this week that uh, Grotendieck was maybe uh, e an even better mathematician than he realized. Uh, because apparently some of these things which he thought were not actually that important actually turn out to be more and more important than he realized. And I think universes are one of these. Uh, so tell us about how they really thought of universes as sort of a, a technical tool that you might want to fuck around with and replace with galaxies or something like that. But I kind of want to argue that uh, if you change perspective a little bit on universes, uh, then they actually uh, become a very important and fundamental thing, which Grotendi, uh is actually very familiar with uh, in other contexts, namely modulus. Uh, and the, the, the crucial change that you have to do to get there is to talk about universes, not just universes and sets, uh, but universes in topos. So let me first try to uh, motivate and explain uh, what the universes look like in a topos. Uh, so let me let me start, though, by recalling the uh, definition of a, a Grotendieck universe. Uh, so there are slightly different ways to formulate it, but this is sort of the simplest one, maybe, that the Grotendieck universe is supposed to be a set which is closed under all the operations of mathematics. Uh, but it turns out that uh, this, these few axioms are enough to guarantee that. It's a non-empty set, which is transitive, so it, it contains all the elements of any of its elements. Uh, and it's closed under indexed unions. If I have an element of the universe uh, and an indexed family of elements of the universe indexed by that set, then their union is also in the universe. Uh, and it's closed under taking power sets of those elements. Uh, so with, with these few operations, then uh, we can actually also already construct a whole bunch of other operations in uh, uh, mathematics and, and the basic set theory that we use. So for example, uh, it's closed under a universe like this is necessarily closed under subsets because if A is a subset of B and B is in the universe, then A is an element of the power set of B, which is also in the universe. Uh, and so by the transitivity, A is also in the universe. Uh, and uh, we can show, uh, for instance, that uh, there are particular sets are necessarily in the universe because once it's closed under subsets, uh, it contains the empty set because it's not empty and this empty set is a subset of anything. So it contains the empty set. Then it contains the power set of the empty set, which is a one element set. Uh, then it contains the power set of the power set of the empty set, which is a two element set. And so on. Um, I'm going to call this set two. Uh, all, I, I'm care, all I care about at this point is that it's a two element set. Uh, because now once I have a two element set, then uh, I can build functions from two to the universe, uh, which pick out a pair of things, and then I can take an indexed union or other things like that. So uh, let's say I have two sets, A in the universe uh, and B in the universe. Uh, or sorry, let me leave it like this. So I've got my two elements of my, my, my two, sort of these two things, I send them to A and B, and then I can take the union of this index family. Uh, and so that gives me uh, a union of two sets in the universe. Uh, and once I have the union of two sets in the universe, then I can build all sorts of other things, right? So for instance, uh, the Cartesian product of A and B uh, is, can be cut out as a subset of the double power set of A union B. So this is using the, the Kuratowski definition of an ordered pair as a, uh, a, a comma B is a, a set that looks like this. So you can see that uh, it lives in um, the double power set. So the Cartesian product is a subset of the double power set. So U is closed under Cartesian products. Uh, then it's closed under sets of functions. The set of functions from A to B is a subset of the power set of A cross B. Uh, it's a set of uh, uh, relations that are functional. Uh, and I also, finally, I also have um, uh, index products and index uh, disjoint union. Right? So uh, if I have a, a family of sets uh, indexed by an element of the universe. So again, this is like uh, the, my, my context here is like in the, in the action of unions. I have an element of the universe A and I have an index family of elements of the universe, then the, the product of these is a subset of the, uh, the power set of A uh, crossed with the ordinary union here. And so you think of this product as an element of the product of functions, which take an element of A to an element of the corresponding set B of that element. Uh, and so these are ordered pairs consisting, or sets of ordered pairs consisting of the, the first element and the output, just like for an ordinary function. These are sometimes called dependent functions. Uh, and I also maybe care about uh, index disjoint unions. The disjoint union of a bunch of things uh, can be cut out as a subset of this thing in here. And so it's a, uh, if I sort of label every element of uh, B of A with the corresponding uh, element of A, 
then I can get uh, I can cut out a, a disjoint union in this. So all these sorts of operations of mathematics and many more follow from these basic definitions uh, of a universe. Now, uh, this definition of the universe, however, is, is sort of not very structural in the sort of the category theorist sense because it involves set membership and, and uh, various things like that. This transitivity property is very sort of non-structural. So it's natural for a category theorist like me to kind of rephrase it in a more structural way. Uh, and sort of turns out that these operations here of product index products and index co-products are uh, somehow the more most important things that we want to put in structure. So uh, let me compare this definition of Grotenberg universe to what you might call a structural Grotenberg universe, uh, where um, and now uh, from a structural perspective, we're not interested in specific sets, but we're only sort of interested in sets up to bijection. So uh, if we have a set that is uh, small, sort of belongs to the universe, then we should really consider anything bijective to that set to also be equally small. So instead of not having a set of sets, I'm going to say I have a class of sets, which is closed under isomorphism, closed under bijection. Anything which is small, bijective to something else, the other thing is also uh, And sort of the basic axioms here that I need are that it's closed under these disjoint unions and products uh, in precisely the, 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 the uh, way that the ordinary universe was. Uh, and to, just to get things started, I'm going to suppose that we have uh, a zero element set, a one element set, and a two element set are, are small. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see that we can sort of get everything else from that. Uh, and then uh, the, the last thing that we need, though, is because uh, the, the, the important thing about a universe is that this, this U is actually a set rather than a proper class. Uh, and so I can't say, uh, if, I, if I've got something that's closed under isomorphisms, I can't say that that's a set because there are already a proper class of sets with one element. <laughs> right? So I can't sort of close things under isomorphisms and still have a set. But uh, what, so what I'm going to suppose instead is that there's, uh, there's some set of sets, or more say more structurally, a family of sets, uh, which includes at least one uh, representative of each isomorphism class of small sets. So that's what this says. There's a set U and a family of sets indexed by U, such that whenever I have a small set, it's uh, bijective to some E element in that family, some sort of representative or generic family of sets. So this is a proposal for a structural notion of universe. Uh, and uh, we can um, develop sort of uh, various other things from that, right? So uh, in unions, in index unions and products, uh, give me uh, binary unions and products, right? A cross B is, uh, you might call it like the product over a, a two element set uh, of something, a family of sets that will either A or B. Uh, the disjoint union similarly of two sets is the index disjoint union. Here I'm writing colons because I'm a type theorist, but I should write set theorists today. Um, and uh, uh, so similarly, we have like functions, the type of function set of functions from A to B is the product uh, of the a constant family. So uh, the product of A copies of B is the type set of functions from A to B. B, a to B. Um, the power set of a set is, well, it's, uh, it's not equal, but it's isomorphic to the set of functions from A to a two element set. Right? So that's sort of why I threw the two element set in there. So we get the power sets. Uh, and uh, there's one more example that uh, had to show that this, uh, this actually Im implies closure under subsets, which is maybe not completely obvious, but if A is a subset of B uh, and B is a, a, a small set and belong, belongs, or I should say belongs to my S, my set of small, class of small sets, um, then what I can do is I have a, uh, uh, a characteristic function of A, which is a function from B uh, to uh, you might say uh, well two maybe or or um, let me let me say it, it's to this to this this um, universe of, of things and it's it's basically going to send a, uh, an element uh, b to uh, basically the empty set uh, if b is not in a and to a one element set if b is in a so uh, this is basically the characteristic function but now it's valued in sets either in an empty set or a one element set and then once you build this you can see that a is in fact isomorphic. To the index disjoint union of this family of subsingleton sets indexed by B. So uh, this implies that we're now closed under isomorphic closed under subsets too. If B is small, then uh, and we have zero and one, then a subset of B is also small. Okay. So so that's great. Uh, and now the best the best thing the next thing that we can do is once we have a structural notion of universe, then we can take that notion and we can import it into a category other than the category of sets. Because now this is formulated basically in terms, in terms of the category of sets. Now, there's one thing that's very special about the category of sets, which is one, by which I mean the terminal object of the category of sets uh, with one element is a very special set. 
in, this, in the sense that every set is determined by its elements, which are functions out of that terminal object. Uh, up to isomorphism, right? Uh, the elements of a set are functions out of a one element set. Uh, and so when we generalize from talking about a, uh, uh, the, the, the category of sets to some other category, then uh, in the category of sets, where maybe we're interested in elements of some universe, uh, which are the same as functions uh, into the universe. But uh, in some other category, uh, we, we, we can't just talk about functions out of a one element set, but it's enough to talk about functions out of some arbitrary object. Uh, and this is essentially what, what, what uh, we conclude from the, the Oneida lemma, uh, that an object of a category, an arbitrary category, is not determined by maps out of a one element thing, out of the terminal object, but it is determined by the collection of all maps out of everything else in the category, including itself. Uh, and so uh, a map from X into the universe, well, uh, intuitively, if, if U is a universe of sets, then a map into the universe is a, an index family of sets. Right? Uh, but now in, in terms of the category E, uh, the way to represent an indexed family of objects of a category uh, is by, by giving a map from uh, some other objects to the indexing object X. And sort of intuitively, you think of the fibers of this map as being the, index, the, the individual sets in the index family. So uh, in, in the category of sets, uh, what you would think of is you would think of sort of an object, an, uh, element X over there, and then the fiber of that is uh, the set YX, and then this is sort of like the family of, of sets uh, y sub x indexed by uh, elements of my set x. Uh, but sort of in the, in, in, in when we work with in a general category, uh, when we don't have a universe yet, then the way to say an arbitrary family of, of objects is to say we have this object here, which sort of basically acts like the co-product of this family already. Uh, and then it maps uh, down to uh, the, 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 the object. Okay, so our, 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 our categorical notion of universe uh, is going to uh, be a, not about objects of the category that are small, but about morphisms in the category that are small, uh, by which we mean that all their fibers are small in some intuitive sense. Uh, and this definition was written down by uh, Thomas Stryker in 2005. Um, so we have, uh, instead of a set of class of objects or a class of sets, we have a class of morphisms. Uh, and we're going to require that class of morphisms to be stable under pullback. Uh, so uh, what that means is that uh, if I have some uh, morphism here, uh, which is small, which is uh, uh, has intuitively it has small fibers, and then I have some other map here uh, f into the base, and I take the pullback here, uh, so I get um, some other map here, and then what happens uh, intuitively in the category of sets, at least the fibers of this map over here, right? So a uh, the fiber over a uh, in, in this pullback is precisely the fiber on the right hand side over uh, f. Of it. Okay, so if the map on the right hand side is, has small fibers, and the map on the left hand side also has small. Fibers. So we impose that these class of maps has to be stable under pullback. If B is in S, then uh, this pullback is also in S. Uh, and with a suitable formulation that also implies closure under isomorphisms as well. You can you pull back along an identity map, it might as well be something isomorphic. And then we have uh, operations which are analogous to all these structural operations that I have over here. So uh, here, uh, when the fact that we include zero, one, and two, so including zero and one uh, means what is a map whose fibers are zeros or ones? Uh, that's just an injection. All the fibers are either zero or one. So we're going to suppose that our class of maps includes all monomorphisms in our category, which is just a categorical version of injection. Uh, this object two, uh, well, uh, back here, what did we use two for? We used it to build the power set. Uh, and uh, in an arbitrary topos, which is the sort of category that I'm interested in here, uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily have classical logic. So instead of the two, Sitting there, we have to use this other object of truth value or the, uh, the subobject classifier, which we usually call omega. And that's what I'm asserting, asserting here that omega is a small object, meaning its map to the terminal object is a small map. Uh, I'm not going to go into any more of this because I'm not going to use the subobject classifier, but I just put it here because it's part of the definition. Then we have these two operations here, which correspond to these unions and products, right? Uh, and uh, let me uh, be a little bit more explicit about what's going on here. So uh, composition is a categorical version of talking about disjoint unions. So if I have, say, uh, one family of uh, objects like this, where I think intuitively of a uh, fiber over A being B sub A, uh, and then I have another family of objects like this, where I think intuitively of the fiber over B being C sub B, uh, and then I consider the composite like this, what's the fiber 
over that composite over some A. Well, uh, inside B of B A, I have a bunch of Bs, B, B prime, B double prime. And then over each of those, I have the corresponding fiber uh, of C. Uh, and so all the things up in C that map down to A are all the things that might be in any of these guys. So the fiber over A of this composite is really the disjoint union over all elements of the fiber of the corresponding fiber of uh, C. So saying that these, uh, this, these small maps are closed under composition, like I did here, uh, is essentially a categorical way of saying that our small objects are closed under disjoint union. Uh, the, uh, the push forward here is not something that I'm going to be used, so I'm not going to say anything more about it. Uh, what uh, basically it's uh, this this composition is the left adjoint of pullback, push forward is the right adjoint of pullback, and that turns out to be a categorical version of index products instead of index coproducts. What I care more about is this 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 generic morphism. Right. So let's let me go back and look at uh, this generic set. Right. So uh, in the the the, the, the structural category case of sets, we had a set and a family of sets indexed by it. So now. Uh, Structurally, uh, 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 oh, sorry, in our category, a family now is a morphism, uh, and it has small fibers because sort of each of these sets here uh, are supposed to be in the in S. I think I didn't actually write that. Each of these has to be a small set <laughs> in the generic set S. So, um, so, so this now we have this fam this morphism here uh, uh, mapping into our, our generic object U. And its uh, its domain is you see somebody's going to think about it as the co-product of all of these sort of uh, sets, small sets in this this representing family mapping down to their index element. And now this genericity, this property here, this this is stated in terms of an individual set, which again is like a map uh, of something over the terminal object. And so now in a category, instead of talking about an individual small set here, we want to talk about a, a family of small sets indexed by some other set X. Uh, and then uh, to say that there exists an index here, uh, in, uh, in it exists an element of U, uh, that's going to be, say, well, well, there should be one of those for each element of the indexing set X. So that's got to be a function from X or morphism from X to U. Uh, and to say that each fiber, uh, right, each, this, is, uh, this set here is going to correspond to the fibers of these A's. Each fiber is isomorphic to the corresponding fiber of the map on the right. That's basically, that's just saying we have a pullback, set, like I said before. So the, the generic morphism condition says there's a there's a map which fight, which is in S such that any other map in S is a pullback. Okay. So that's this last condition uh, on the striking universe. All right. Now, um, why should Grothendieck have known about this and cared about this? Why could he have? Uh, so if you um, uh, if you look at this last condition, this genericity condition, it, it turns out to look very much like the notion of a classifying space or a moduli space. Uh, but now, in order to explain what's going on there, uh, I need to think about a topos in a slightly different way uh, than some of the other ways that we have been seeing. So uh, as we know, um, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different ways to think about a topos. Uh, you can think about it as a category that behaves like a category of sets. And that's sort of what I've been doing so far by saying, taking this notion that makes sense in the category of sets and importing it into some other category. Uh, you can also think of a topos as a kind of generalized space. Uh, and that's been mentioned uh, a number of times before. You start to, to have some, some ordinary space. You can build topos that achieves on it. You think of a topos, a general topos, as some generalization of that. Um, Olivia just told us about how we can think of topos as, as uh, Morita equivalent class representatives of theories of some kind. Um, but I want to instead think about a topos uh, as a kind of category whose objects behave like spaces themselves. Uh, and th this dichotomy between topos as as spaces and topos as, as categories of spaces is sometimes called the, the little topos, big topos distinction. Sometimes people say it in French, but I'm not going to try to do that because I don't speak pronounce French very well. Um, and uh, uh, it, they're, they're sort of complementary. Uh, neither of them is necessarily right or wrong. Some topos are you know, more naturally thought of as little topos. Some topos are more naturally thought of as big topos. Um, here are some particular toposes uh, that are often thought of as big toposes. Well, simplicial sets have been mentioned before. I can think of an individual simplicial set as kind of like a uh, space of some kind. They have a homotopy theory that's actually equivalent to that of topological spaces. Uh, condensed sets were mentioned before. A condensed set is some kind of a space. Uh, Pycnotic sets are a similar uh, uh, thing which has been studied very similar to condensed sets uh, with sort of slight diff variations in how they deal with size. Uh, an older uh, Topos of this kind, due to Johnstone, uh, sometimes called unsequential spaces. 
uh, basically, uh, this is a, a generalization of sequential spaces, spaces whose topology is determined by convergent sequences. Uh, you can sort of enhance those to a topos, which is well behaved. Um, or you can start with some little topos. And instead of taking sort of sheaves on something, you can take some Winchell sheaves or maybe some Winchell free sheaves or something like this. And now you have something which is, uh, whose objects are sort of spaces in the, in the simplicial sense, but where they're also sort of parameterized by your base space. Um, so this is sort of a, a topos, which is partly little and partly big. You know, so there are all these different kinds of, of, of big toposes, and these are the toposes that I have in mind to be working in. Uh, and now um, in some world of spaces, so, so E here is now my, my big topos where I'm thinking of its objects as spaces, I have some notion of a moduli space or a classifying space or representing objects for a functor. Uh, it's so important that it has many different names. Uh, and the fancy categorical way of saying that is that if I, so I have a functor, a contrary functor from my, my, my category E to sets, and a, a moduli space for this functor is an object of the category uh, together with a natural isomorphism from that functor to the representable functor at that object. Uh, and if you apply the Oneida lemma and sort of compile that out into more explicitly version that doesn't refer to words like natural isomorphism, what you get is it's a space, it's an object, um, together with an element of the functor at that object. Right? So F is a functor to set, so I can evaluate it at the F. I have a particular object in B, uh, F of BF, which is universal, in the sense that any other uh, element of f of x for any other space x uh, is determined by a unique map into the classifying space. So there's a unique x map from x to bf, which pulls back my universal object b to x. So g is a f is a contragrade functor. So f of g maps backwards from f of bf to f of x, and it takes my b to my, my little b to my little x. So um, the examples that you should think about are uh, where f of X is some kind of collection of geometric objects over X or parameterized by X, or some sort of theory like that. So for instance, one of the classical example is F of X uh, is this, maybe the collection of vector bundles over X. There are probably some people out there who know that I'm lying, but please keep your mouth shut for now. <laughs> so uh, if I think of F of X as, as sort of the, the collection, the set of vector bundles over X, then uh, what's going on? This space BF, you can think of it as sort of the, the, the space whose points are vector spaces. And why is that? Because if I have a vector bundle over X, right, then each element of X, each point of X, whatever that means, the fiber over that point is a vector space. And so uh, it makes sense that I should have a map from X to the set of vector spaces. Uh, and the fact that my that these these fibers are sort of glued together nicely to make a vector bundle over X uh, is sort of encapsulated in the fact that this map from X into BF is continuous. It's sort of continuous the vector bundle continuously assigns a vector space to every point of space. Uh, and so uh, what this is saying is that there's some universal vector bundle over uh, my universe my my space BF such that any other vector bundle is is classified by a map into BF uh, and it's the pullback of that universal. And so this is the, the, the idea of a modular space. And of course, this looks very similar uh, to the notion of generic morphism in a universe that I mentioned. So I claim that, in fact, a uh, striker universe is the primordial moduli space. Uh, and by that, uh, I mean partly that it's sort of the, the, the most general or most powerful moduli space because it doesn't just classify vector bundles. It classifies arbitrary maps. With small fibers, and right over here, when I've got, uh, I require that this thing is a vector bundle. So that means all of its fibers are some fixed vector space, uh, or it's morphic to some fixed vector space. Uh, and then uh, uh, they they have additional structure. They have to be uh, vector spaces, and the sort of the, the, the trans transform maps have to preserve that vector space. But in the case of uh, a striker universe, uh, when I, I've got uh, an arbitrary map uh, here, uh, an arbitrary map uh, with small fibers. Uh, and then I, I can classify that by map into large map. Now, primordial, I mean more than that, though. I don't just mean that it classifies lots of things, but I mean that starting from the universe, I can build all sorts of other moduli spaces that I might want to have. Right? Um, so uh, let me just give, give a, a couple of examples of that. So um, suppose I want to build a moduli space uh, for the functor uh, consisting of, where f of x consists of bundles over x. 
with uh, some fixed fiber. Right, so I'm going to fix some object S and space S and consider bundles uh, or maps maps into S where all the fibers are isomorphic to S. Right? So now uh, what I claim is that from U, uh, I can build a moduli space for this functor, the classifying space for this functor. Uh, so this is B so F sub S. Uh, and this is basically just uh, intuitively, this is the connected component. of S as an element of the universe. So I can think intuitively of U, the universe, as a space whose points are spaces. Uh, and then I have uh, I sort of uh, individually, I, I, I can say oh, I've got some point in there, which is a particular space X. And I take the connected component of that space. And sort of that connected component is the classifying space of this. Because when, what happens, right? So this, um, uh, if I have a bundle over X uh, with fibers uh, that are S, then uh, I have my, my classifying map into the universe. Uh, well, every fiber is S. So it, it sort of, it, it factors through this subobject consisting of uh, only the point S. Kind of waving my hands here, right? You think uh, I have a single point. Uh, maybe I should, you could think this really should just be a single point rather than some interesting classifying space. But uh, this sort of the, the, uh, uh, the, the interesting stuff that happens is sort of encapsulated in the way that we talk about connected component inside of some topos. We have to have some way of making sense of that. Um, but once you have a way of making sense of that, then you can build this, uh, this classifying space here as this connected component. So that's one example. Um, another example, uh, so in the case of vector, vector bundles, right, we wanted to restrict the fibers to be some vector space. But we also wanted to have the fibers be equipped with some vector space structure. So in addition to restricting the fibers here, I can also equip the, the, them with some extra structure here. Uh, so let's say, uh, so let's do a simpler case. Let's consider um, the, 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 the case of um, uh, uh, bundles, I'll say, uh, bundles of uh, magmas over X. What's a magma? A magma is a set with a binary operation. No axioms or anything else. And so that's a very, the, very, sort of the simplest uh, primordial thing that you might um, want uh, in an algebra. And so uh, when I say a bundle of magmas, what that means is that I have each a map, a bi binary operation on each fiber. So this is, a, I have a map from, from Y to X. Uh, and then uh, the domain of a binary operation is the Cartesian square. So the Cartesian square of the fibers, this is just the fiber product. So I have a map like this over X, right? So now I can build a classifying space or a moduli space of magmas out of the universe uh, by sort of basically doing this construction in the universal case. Right, so uh, I have uh, this sort of U tilde, which is the universal uh, bundle of the universal family of small uh, spaces, and I can build a fiber product of, of that with itself over U, and then I can consider, well, if I had a map from here to here, then that would be a magma structure on the universal bundle, and so that would be saying that every space has a magma structure. Of course, not every space has specified magma structure, but instead, what I want to do is consider the object, the space that classifies such things. Uh, and I can build that because I have uh, exponential objects in my focus. Uh, I have uh, these Cartesian product, uh, these, these, these push forwards or these local exponentials. So basically what I do is I take the uh, exponential, uh, the internal palm for the Cartesian uh, closed monoidal structure uh, in the, the, the slice category over the universe. And that uh, maps down to the universe, and this turns out to be my B uh, magma. Okay. So you can do the same sort of thing for all kinds of algebraic structures. Um, it can classify <coughs> bundles of rings and bundles of fields and bundles of groups and bundles of vector spaces with some fixed uh, structure on them, all sorts of things like that you can build out as primordial modules. So um, Gordon, they love moduli spaces, right? Um, so why, why, who they love love universes? Now, um, then I can't resist uh, uh, putting in a little plug here uh, for uh, a little bit of syntax. So uh, here, uh, in this example here, I sort of did this by hand. I said, well, I'm going to sort of build this connected component, maybe however I do that. And then I'm going to sort of consider this, this exponential because that sort of makes sense to do something to do to talk about this, this, this magma structure. But actually, there's a general machine that will do this for you. So uh, if I basically, if I just write down something like uh, over here, like, uh, the set of uh, small sets uh, with some binary operation on it, or the set of sets with some group structure on it, or the set of sets with some vector space structure on it, then um, there's a syntactic machine which you, 
put that into, uh, and, and it will necessarily uh, automatically interpret it in some topos and give us these moduli spaces of, of the magmas and groups of vector spaces and things that have looked at. Uh, and in the general case, the, uh, this is called homotopy type theory, and the sort of the simpler case is just ordinary dependent type theory. Uh, and I don't want to say any more about that, but uh, uh, maybe I'll say a little bit more about it. Later. So now I'm ready to tell you about why I was lying. Uh, right. So there's a, there's a problem with building these moduli spaces, which is that in usually these examples that we're looking at, f of x is not a set. Uh, we're not naturally a set, but it's more naturally a groupoid or a category even. Um, because uh, these objects that we're thinking about, like vector bundles, uh, there are isomorphisms between them. Uh, two vector space vector bundles can be isomorphic. They can be isomorphic in more than one way. A given vector bundle can have automorphisms, can be isomorphic to itself in lots of interesting ways. Uh, and so it doesn't really make sense to ask that this groupoid over here is isomorphic to a mere set of morphisms into this classified. Yeah. So um, there are different ways to solve this problem, or at least to sort of get around this problem or deal with it. Um, one of them uh, is to work with what's sometimes called a coarse moduli space, where instead of a, an isomorphism here, you just have a map that says, uh, whenever I have uh, a bundle over X, then I get a map into the classifying space. And it's natural, but nothing, I mean, you know, there's some sort of universality condition or whatever, but in particular, it doesn't tell you that Y is the pullback of anything at all over BF. And it doesn't even tell you that there is anything at all over BF. So there is sort of no universal thing in the case of a course moduli space. So that's a little bit disappointing. Um, a better thing you could do is talk about a moduli stack. Uh, so you can say, well, uh, this thing on the left, this FX is a groupoid. So let's promote the thing on the right to be a groupoid too. Uh, and this is a hum set. So that means that now our, our category E has to be boosted up to be some kind of higher category. It has to be a two category whose homs are groupoid. Or maybe an infinity category whose homs are infinity groupoids uh, or something like that. Uh, and uh, and that that works, uh, but it's uh, it's a little bit uh, technically annoying uh, because as we've heard uh, before, it's sort of a, a difficult to work with these sort of higher categories and higher groupoids in some um, combinatorial way. Uh, and uh, uh, we'd like to have something which is a little more sort of concrete and easy to work with. Uh, and in particular, uh, for this uh, for the purposes of having this nice syntactic machine. It's a lot harder to build a syntactic machine that ends up in something flabby like a, an infinity category. If you know what an infinity category is, if it's a quasi category or a complete single space or whatever model you like, uh, that uh, Simona and, and Simona were talking about, um, all of those are sort of really sort of flabby things, uh, whereas syntax is sort of a very strict set theoretic like thing. So it's difficult to build a model like this. Uh, it's much easier if what we're landing in over here uh, is, e is still just a one ordinary one category. Um, so uh, I would like to sort of try to avoid having to work explicitly with these uh, infinity categories. Uh, and uh, the third thing that you can do is the thing that Stryker did, uh, which he called, which we sometimes called a generic space or a generic object. Uh, and if you look back at the definition, uh, let me see if I can find it here, right? Uh, what did we say? We said for every, uh, for every, well, there's, there's this small map such that for every other small map, there is a pullback. But we didn't say there is a unique pullback, right? So that's the difference between that uh, and this moduli space here, where in the definition of moduli space, we did require it to be unique. So in the categorical language here, uh, having a generic space means that instead of an isomorphism, we have just a map, but in the opposite direction from a coarse moduli space. Now we have a map from the representable functor to uh, the functor f that we're trying to represent. And this map is a surjection. So uh, that's precise. That tells us precisely this this genericity property that says um, uh, the the Oneida lemma applied to this sort of uh, uh, mapping representable tells me that there is some uh, uh, EF over here uh, which I can pull back to get something over X, uh, and then the surjectivity property here uh, is what tells me that whenever I have something living over X, there exists at least one uh, thing over here mapped to BF which makes that a pullback. Okay. Now, uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this generic property all by itself is not strong enough to get all the geometric stuff that we would like. In particular, it's weaker than being an actual moduli stack. Uh, and it, it sort of, it doesn't give us, it doesn't tell us that the, 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 the moduli space BF 
doesn't sort of include all of the geometric information that we'd like to see about the functor f, uh, because we just have this surjection. We don't have any sort of equivalence. Um, but it turns out that there is a very nice enhancement of this genericity property, uh, which uh, I first encountered in uh, the work of uh, Rogowski on uh, building a model of, of uh, univalence axiom in completional sets. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that it, similar things have appeared other way, ways as well. And sort of since then, it's been used a lot by those of us who are building models of type theory, and then also turned out to have uh, many other applications as well. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm calling this today, this is a bit of a, a non step definition, I'm calling this a strong homotopy moduli space. And uh, the, the idea is that we, we strengthen this notion of surjectivity. Uh, instead of requiring this map to be surjective, we require it to be a trivial vibration. Uh, and uh, 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 disciples of Makai might call this a very surjective map. Um, so, so what does that mean? Uh, I'm not going to try to specify exactly what a trivial vibration is in general. If you, if you know about lifting properties, it means that it has the right lifting property with respect to all monomorphism. Uh, but if I, if I sort of compile that out into, and talk about uh, what happens to for classifying things, here's what it means. It means if I have any monomorphism in my topos, uh, let's call it F, um, and I have some objects, some element, let's say, uh, uh, let's call it uh, X in F of B, right? So that uh, maps down to uh, B. So this is some vector bundle or some space or whatever living over B. And I can restrict it along my monomorphism to get uh, F star X, uh, some moduli, some, some vector bundle or, or space or something living over A. And now uh, I'm gonna suppose that I have a classifying map G uh, for F star of X. Right? So remember every uh, element of F of something, right? so F, F star of X here lives in F of A, uh, it's classified by some map into BF, but in general, there might be more than one in my generic case. So let's suppose I have, I have some such thing. Uh, so that means that F star X is equal to G star of B, where B is this sort of universal uh, thing in F of BF. Okay, so this is the setup uh, of this, this condition for it to be a strong homotopy moduli space. For, for any setup like this, uh, we're going to stipulate that there exists a classifying map for X. So this is, a, a, there exists an H such that X is equal to H star of B. And this lower triangle commutes, G is equal to HF. So what does that mean? Um, if you think about, first of all, think about the case when A is the initial object, the empty set, then sort of everything on the left disappears. And this basically reduces to genericity. It's saying whenever I have some object of L element of F of B over B, then there exists a classifying map for it, H. And there's sort of, there are no more conditions when A is empty and it is the initial object. In general, what it's saying is, if I have some, some bundle over B and I want to classify it, but I've already classified its restriction to some sub-object of B, then I can choose a classifying map for, for, for it, which extends that existing classifying map that I've already got. So uh, the classifying maps are, no, are still not unique, uh, but they have this, this, this sort of, uh, stronger property that I, I can't, I don't, I don't just say I can choose an arbitrary classifying map for something. I can say if I've already classified it over part of the, the, the base, then I can extend that classifying map to the rest of it. Uh, and in the case of a striker universe, at least this is sometimes called a realignment property uh, because uh, it, 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 in the case of the, the, the universe, but basically what, you, what you're saying is that you have this sort of thing here uh, and you have some, um, uh, some map over B and some map over A uh, and, and a pullback square here. And then you have a classifying map for um, this map back there. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to require, right, because X and Y here have to live in the, the sphincter. So that means that these maps both have to have small fibers. And so, so having small fibers uh, for this map from Y to B means that it has some classifying map into the universe, but it might not be a good one. It might not make this triangle commute. And so we're saying we, we can sort of realign that classifying map so that it does make this triangle down there. Is there a question? No? Okay. 
So, so this is the uh, this is the stronger notion of genericity, uh, and it turns out that this stronger notion of genericity is enough to show that we actually have a moduli set. That we actually uh, it, 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 we actually have this strong equivalence condition in some sort of higher groupoidal sense. Uh, and uh, in order to make sense of that, of course, we need to have some connection between our one topos E and some infinity category. And I'm not going to be very precise about that. Generally, what we do is we have some sort of fill and model structure, which has been mentioned before. Um, but the, the, the piece of a fill and model structure that I need to give to explain to you a piece of this conclusion uh, is a cylinder object. And so I'm not going to try to prove this in general because that would require giving a lot of definitions. But what I will show is that uh, if I have a strong homotopy moduli space, then classifying maps are unique up to homotopy. So if I have two, uh, if I have two maps that classify the same element, then they are homotopic to each other. And what does it mean to be homotopic to each other? So uh, in classical homotopy theory, a homotopy between two maps uh, is a map out of uh, x cross a unit interval. Right. So uh, what I need for my for my category is I've got some kind of cylinder object. This is a sort of a, called a cylinder on X. Uh, and uh, this so I'm supposing as part of having a fill and model structure, I have a cylinder object, which I'm writing as X cross I, although in general, it doesn't have to be X. And the structure that I need on a cylinder is that it maps down to X. Uh, so you can squash the cylinder um, to uh, the, 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 the sides. Uh, and that's map is it's a homotopy of equivalence. And then you can include two copies of X on both sides of the cylinder, right? So, so sort of X, so this is like the cylinder here. And then I've got two copies of X, uh, which map into the top and the bottom of the cylinder. Uh, and then I can sort of squash the whole thing back down to a single copy of X. And the composite well, along here is just the full map, uh, which uh, is X as the identity on each copy, okay? Now, uh, and this, the, the crucial piece here is that this inclusion here of the two sides of the cylinder is a monomorphism. Essentially, that the two sides of the cylinder don't overlap with each other. If it makes this an injection. And once we have that, then what can we do? So we can say, well, suppose I have um, two classifying maps uh, for the same object. Right, so F star of B equals G star of B. Uh, this is the thing that's classified over X. Uh, and now um, these two maps together give me a map from the co-product of X with itself into my classifying space. Uh, and they, 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 uh, what they classify, what this, this map classifies is, um, uh, well, in the, in the let, me, let me write this in the case of the, uh, uh, the universe, easier to understand. <clears throat> So I've got some map over X, which is classified by uh, two maps in the universe. And then this, this pair here classifies uh, two copies of Y. Because both of these maps classify Y. But now I'm gonna apply my realignment property. So here's my cylinder object down here, which again, right, this, this is a monomorphism mapping these two copies of X into the cylinder. Uh, and I've got a, uh, I've got an object living over the cylinder too, uh, which I can take get by pulling back uh, y along this projection to x. So this is basically like a constant uh, uh, vibration living over the cylinder, and then I'm saying I restrict that to both sides of the cylinder. And now what I've got, I've got I've got a subobject of the cylinder, uh, and namely the two sides of it, and I've got a classifying map for the copies of y over the sides of the cylinder namely F on one side and G on the other side. And so my, my realignment property or my strong homotopy trivial vibration thing tells me I can extend that classifying map to give me a map from the whole cylinder into U. And that thing here is precisely a homotopy from F to G, right? It's a map from a cylinder into the universe, uh, which restricts to F on one side of the cylinder and G on the other side. So you take this idea and you sort of uh, put it on steroids and boost it up to infinity dimensions and you sort of get this, this fact that a strong homotopy moduli space is in fact a moduli stack in this sort of uh, model categorical sense. Okay. Um, this isn't the only use of this realignment property. Uh, it uh, can be used uh, to show that nested universes can be given cumulative set theoretic operations. So if you, you have one universe contained inside another one and sort of in the smaller universe, you have these operations of product and disco union and so on. 
and you would like to have them the same operations on the bigger universe, which agree on the things in the smaller universe with the ones you already had. And that's essentially a real alignment problem as well. Um, it's uh, in these, these cumulative universes that then can be used to show independence results of sort of constructive logic. Uh, the, my co authors uh, on this paper use it to show canonicity and normalization via synthetic case computability. Uh, and I don't want to try to explain what that means, um, but there it is. So, uh, the last piece here, I want to say a little bit about how we can construct these universes with the real element problem. So, here's a few minutes here. So if I start with the Grundy universe in the category of sets, then assuming that the category of sets is classical with the excellent choice and the middle and all this, then it automatically satisfies realignment because if I'm in this situation uh, over here, like uh, in the realignment situation, I wanna find my H, how do I do it? Well, any element of B, now B is just a set, any element of B is either in the image of F or it isn't. And so if it is in the image of F, then I'll just use G, my classifying map that I already have for the things in the subset. And if it's not, then I'll choose some classifying map for it, some, some, some image for it to be for, for, for something to be an image. And I know I can do that because of the genericity of the universe. Uh, and then that defines a function because essentially because of classical logic, like everything is either a function A or not. And so you, in a general topos, you can do this if you have a complemented monomorphism, but in general, your monomorphism is not complemented. Uh, and so you need to be careful about how you build these universes in order to get this realignment property. Uh, so uh, in uh, uh, 1997, uh, Hoffman and Stryker showed that if you start with a Grotten deep universe in the category of sets, then you can use that to define a, a, a universe of this kind in a pre sheet topos. Uh, and basically what they did is they said, well, uh, to use the Unata lemma, uh, sort of the a value of a, a pre sheaf universe at some object X of the domain category should be the same as a map with small fibers over the representable pre sheaf uh, by the innate lemma. And then so you sort of consider the set of all those represent those fibers, things that mapping over the, the, the representable pre sheaves. And then you do sort of do futz around with, with some, some coherence things to make it a strict pre sheaf, and that gives you a universe. Um, and th these lifted universes also satisfy realignment, although. Uh, I think they didn't observe that at the time because it sort of hadn't been <laughs> entered people's consciousness, but it turns out that it works um, as long as you start from a nice classical category of sets. But not every topos is a pre sheaf topos. Uh, sheaf toposes are very interesting as well. Uh, and uh, uh, in 2005, in the same paper where he defined this general notion of a universe in a topos, uh, Stryker constructed universes in sheaf toposes basically by starting with the Hoffman Stryker universe in a pre sheaf topos and applying the associated sheaf function. Uh, and that turns out to give you a nice universe, a nice enough universe, but it, it satisfies the genericity property. But as far as anyone knows, it doesn't satisfy the realignment property. I don't know of a proof that it actually doesn't, but there, nobody has been able to see why it might, because sort of the, uh, the obvious thing you just try to do is get started working that stuff. Um, so we need to do something different. Uh, and uh, so for, there's actually um, uh, a bit of a, a history here about sort of for a while, people thought that maybe you couldn't, you, you couldn't, couldn't do this. And so people didn't think that you were able to prove these independence results with using a sheaf topos and you sort of had to go to the stack model or whatever. But uh, eventually it turns out that actually is possible. Uh, and I just want to say very quickly about, about how we do this. So um, suppose you start with some, you have some universe that doesn't satisfy realignment. Um, so there's some realignment problem that it doesn't satisfy like this, right? So that I don't have any left for B to U here. Well, what can I do? Uh, well, um, I can try to fix it. And make a new universe by taking a push out down here. And right, I basically glue in new elements to my universe so that I have, I can fill this, I can solve this realignment problem. And now I need to be able to, I need to have a U prime tilde up here. And so the obvious thing to do is to take the push out of this square up here as well. And then I get a map down there. Uh, and there's a magical property of a topos, which is called uh, being adhesive. Which is one of these exactness properties that appear in like Giraud's theorem or whatever. Although Giraud didn't write down the specific specific one, but uh, it's it's implied by the ones that he did write down, which implies that whenever you have a pushout square down here and a monomorphism on the left, uh, and a pushout square up there, and these two maps, these two squares are pullbacks, then it follows that these two squares are also pullbacks. 
And that tells you, for instance, that this new map from U tilde prime to U prime is again a small map uh, that takes a little bit of work. Uh, it implies that it still classifies everything that the original universe classified. Uh, and it also tells you that it classifies this new map by this, this pullback square that you have in front. So, um, so that works to sort of glue in a single solution to a single realignment problem. Uh, if you have a lot of realignment problems, you can fix them all at once by gluing in a whole bunch of things. Uh, there could be a proper class of them, but uh, we'll worry about that later. Uh, and second of all, U prime might introduce new unsolved realignment problems that you didn't have back in U. So you have to do it again uh, and build a U double prime. And then you have to do it again and build a U triple prime. And you sort of continue on forever. And then you have to continue on after forever uh, into omega plus one and omega plus two and so on and transfinitely. And you don't know when you're going to stop. So uh, this is the basic idea. And then you basically solve these problems using uh, a technical tool from homotopy theory called cofiber generation. So I don't want to get into the details of this, but basically you say there's a, there's a set of monomorphisms which sort of suffice to generate all the other monomorphisms. So you could just restrict to the uh, realignment problems involving that set generating set. Uh, and then that generating set uh, has some bounded size. And that sort of tells you how far you have to continue uh, in your transfinite iteration in order to make things work. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can stop after that many steps, and that gives you your construction of the universe. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say. <laughs>